partly reflecting that sort of where are we in the sector um, and, the, and what I perceive as being a strengthening being a strength in being in that third sector uh, or voluntary sector or role. Someone earlier on said there's, there's no sector for this to work. The voluntary sector exists, the third sector, the charitable sector. Um, I appreciate that this kind of, it is kind of a fairly controversial um, uh, model because lots of local authorities are looking at trust to deliver all sorts of things from your museums to your libraries and all sorts of other things. But hopefully by presenting uh, Perthic and Ross Heritage Trust's um, model over and our involvement in uh, this kind of work over the last 12 years or so, uh, I can show that, it is a, it, that there is a strength to it. Uh, and I'm not really doing this in order to showcase, but rather to, uh, to illustrate a process of building partnerships, uh, building capacity, and accruing experience and fundraising, etc. Uh, the, the main way we differ from the Wilshire Archaeological Trust is that we don't have a commercial field unit, if you like, um, so we tend to work in partnership with other contractors to deliver these things. At the end, I'll try to offer some quick assessment of the pros and cons of this and of the models for community work. <coughs> um, uh, we, Matt Ritchie was just explaining uh, regional archaeology and the need for regional research frameworks. We had a really successful um, session yesterday here about research frameworks, and I completely agree. SCARF and the work that Jeff Sanders has done is fantastic. But what we really need now are a series of regional research frameworks. That, um, that reflect what, what SCARF has said nationally and, and how that's reflected in each, in each area. And we put Scotland in a really good place to do that now. We heard yesterday how Wales had effectively done it the other way around. They've done regional research frameworks and then built a national uh, framework around that. I think we're really well placed to do that. And I think, you know, as we've just heard in Hampshire, the, the county archaeologists have a really critical role and being able to balance up uh, what those priorities are. Um, and you know, it's good to see that having started already with Aberdeenshire as we're leaving and the great work of, of that Bruce has uh, been carried out with that. Um, a little bit more about definitions now, and I'll try not to repeat stuff that um, we've already talked about, but you know, who, 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 who is the community? Uh, people who live locally, is it everyone? Uh, are these special interest groups? What are volunteers? All that stuff. Um, our view is that effectively the community is anybody, and that's kind of the point we take. We don't think we're going to develop a project with that local, that field group or, or, this, uh, or this local community that live in this area. All our projects are devised to involve anybody effectively who wants to be involved. Um, uh, again, students, universities charging students to go on things. Uh, you know, primary school students, secondary school students, university stu students, it's all part of this. And in fact, our policy is that that mix of people that are involved in our projects is critical to their success. Having local volunteers who have never been in a dig but have local knowledge, having university students who don't know the area but know about how to draw or whatever, and having amateur archaeologists who, are, who have come in uh, from further afield and have those special interests. We can come back to the semantics of Amateurs and professionals later on, perhaps. And um, also, I think, in terms of HLF and some of these other uh, funders now, you know, what, 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 what other areas that I should be aiming to engage with have to reach audiences, disadvantaged youth? You know, perhaps some of the people that can be, get, uh, can be, be left behind um, against the, uh, uh, the, the uh, sharp elk with middle classes at times. Uh, our policy is simple in the trust in that we offer free uh, accommodation, travel, all of those uh, subs uh, subsistence, etc., to volunteers in recognition of what they're contributing. Uh, and really, we, we effectively treat volunteers as we do other members of staff. It's quite simple in terms of all your other sorts of uh, uh, considerations. Uh, some other things to think about. Um, Who is? Uh, we talked a little bit about top-down. Uh, projects and perhaps national projects with a theme is decided and, uh, and, and that's delivered sort of top down and then community bottom up projects with community saying we want to study um, this and that in our local community. I'm going to suggest that there's kind of almost a middle path based on community consultation where you can have a bit of both of that and a lot of things which ultimately you can tie together to the greater good in the longer term. Uh, but it also raises questions of you know funding strategy. Who's funding it? Why are they funding it? Etc. So really, onto the trust. Um, 
We are a third sector organisation established in 1988. The key thing is who our partners are. You can see we've got a local authority on board. You've heard a little bit about local authorities and all the various aspects that they are involved with. We have the Civic Trust themselves, a third sector organisation involved with Heritage. And you have a grant giving organisation, the Ganaki Trust, um, a, a, a local organisation. Uh, we're a company limited by guarantee uh, and also a Scottish charity. So in that, in that fact, it makes us quite similar uh, uh, as, as a business model to the Welsh Trusts. Uh, we've got three full-time members of staff, but we also have project staff that come along uh, to deliver individual projects as they arise. Um, effectively, for the first 15 years, we were really a Buildings Preservation Trust and involved in lots of architectural projects. And this really remains um, an important part of our work. Importantly, we have a conservation accredited architect as well as a team, and we really strive for that kind of seamless approach to uh, archaeological buildings. Um, and it was those open day, we've heard a little bit about this before, but it was really the start of our outreach work, if you like, went right back to the sort of mid-90s. And it was really our involvement with that that kind of led on to Archaeology Month, which we developed from about 2003, and that was basically to give a complementary program to, uh, to those Open Day, but it was also in uh, recognition of Highland Archaeology Week, uh, the Scottish Archaeology Month, um, uh, and the CBA National Archaeology Day, as we've heard about. Uh, and one of the exciting things that we've developed from that, and that we are trying to engage communities, has been this kind of living history, making long boats and sort of uh, craft-based living history events rather than the militaristic musket and sword wielding which commonly, uh, I'm sure you'll have seen, um, uh, is commonly used. And we, we found this is a really, really valuable tool for engaging schools and more importantly uh, senior managers and educational children services for them to get drawn into kind of heritage projects more broadly. But there are still occasions where you can get to play with axes. Um, we heard how the HGR is important in local authorities and really this top slide here is representing that. We took on that role uh, and through a service of agreement we deliver the planning archaeology service to the local authority since 2000. We invested heavily uh, from 2000 in going from a pre-SMR defined by Baker up to an HGR over the period of three or four years. Um, and it really underpins everything we do. Um, you know, that's how we select things, that's how we, we restore things, it's really critical to our work. Uh, but because of our third sector um, position, it means we've got a wider remit. So, you know, it's allowed us to carry on a not for profit basis things like the Carpeau Local Project, which was really, in a sense, a rescue archaeology project, and allowed us to work with other partners, bring on funders, and work with contractors to deliver that project. But really, for this talk, one of the key projects I'd like to talk about here is uh, the Black Scout project. And really, the idea of this was it was a community-based project uh, in that we engaged anyone who wanted to be involved in this project. But the topic that we decided for it was one which was regionally important to our area. It was a site type which was purely uh, or misunderstood. They were thought to be early medieval sites and there were a number of previous excavations that had been poorly written up and there was a misconception about what they were. So over a five year period, uh, we carried out a, a number of excavations uh, which led to this publication and showed that they were in fact Iron Age of Nature, albeit with uh, early medieval reoccupation. And we were able in the publication to tie all this into uh, all of the scarf, um, scarf research agendas, etc. Uh, but really moving on, uh, oops, to the uh, Heritage Lottery Fund um, sort of uh, project, and of course described as a lottery ladder, we sort of took our first step on this, if you like, in 2005 with a fairly uh, three-year project, bringing staff in again. It was really building on the work we've done with Archaeology Month, so providing guided walks, uh, small excavations, a series of talks, etc. But the idea was to do this year round rather than it being a one off week or uh, monthly event. But importantly, it got us going uh, and allowed us uh, to, to get involved, explore this avenue of funding. Uh, this then led to a number of thematic projects within the area, again, sort of reflecting um, issues that were important to, uh, to us locally that we could identify. 
Um, so this project looked at 18th century military bridges, Jibbo Wage and uh, Caulfield, etc. And this was really I was beginning to explore and involved with schools more. So Duke of Edinburgh, formal schools and education packs, all of this kind of stuff. And also importantly, um, outreach um, products like maps and publications, etc. Uh, we then sort of repeated this with the graveyard project. Uh, this time the emphasis was more on skills and training and began to edge into another important aspect of HLF funding, which is skills training, you know, recognising where there are skills. And of course this feeds directly back into disadvantaged youth, uh, perhaps people who are uh, in a box store or who are in, a, 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 you know, in an open prison, perhaps they're, they're best we are back, in, back into normal society, perhaps only job they've had is flinging around the OPC. So if we can involve them in uh, really an area where there's identified skills shortages uh, in, uh, in that kind of area of work, there's really high potential um, for engaging with people in a really significant way. Uh, this is really the next project that we'd really like to linger on a little bit. Um, and again, you can see our, our partners are beginning to expand a little bit. We're bringing more people on board. And along with North Lake Heritage, we've developed this project, again, with this kind of middle range kind of view of saying, what's a, what's a, 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 a neglected narrative in our area? And we come up with uh, this idea of uh, or, or, or the, these uh, early medieval tough longhouses that survive with, with lens uh, up in the northeast of our area. Um, they'd been identified in the 1980s. Uh, only one had been excavated in the 1990s by Glasgow University. That was published last <coughs> year. Um, so we realised that you know there's a huge potential here that's really just missed out this whole top building tradition. Um, so we've uh, created the project there. And again, the people talk, we're talking about the cost efficiency of, of this project. This total project budget is probably between 50 and 60 thousand pounds. So really fairly small investment for uh, pushing forward a whole stream of research which has been um, largely neglected. Uh, but it is, you know, primary school, secondary <coughs> school, tertiary education and lifelong learning. Uh, so you, you're able to balance both, I think. And who we've got to now is, if you like, we're at the top of the lottery ladder with the Hindi views uh, of the landscape partnership scheme. So in, in this, this is a, a, a £1.4 million HLF grant with a total project value of £2.6 million. Um, so we're accruing about £800,000 of uh, other external cash <coughs> funding, uh, about £150,000 of in kind contributions from other partners in Canada, a quarter of a million pounds of volunteer contributions, uh, and we're bringing on a team of five people for five years to deliver the project. So, uh, you know, it's, it's significant stuff, and, and in terms of what that's allowing us to do in one landscape, uh, for me, the most exciting thing is it allows us to tie things together with everything else that's happening in that landscape. Um, so it's historic environment, it's access, it's biodiversity, but it's all underpinned by outreach, training, community involvement, etc. Um, we spent two years developing this. There's no quick uh, funding stream here. Uh, we spent about a third of a million pounds getting to this stage. Uh, and the process, again, is important. Audience development plans. It's, it's, uh, Quite intensive community consultation to find out what community needs are, etc. Landscape characterization and assessments, etc. etc. But really to, to kind of see how these things maybe join up a little bit, uh, one of the projects we're looking at in, uh, in the landscape partnership scheme is to excavate a number of hill forts around the estuary. And that ties into not only things like the Hill Forts Atlas project and things identified on SCARF, but it ties into a research project carried out by Glasgow University in the landscape to the west of where we are. Uh, and you can see one of the excavations of one of the hill forts there. But it also ties in back to our black spout um, uh, excavation. So you can see our, our broch-like structure in the black spout there. So it's given us a bit of uh, context for both excavations. And it's allowing us to look at monumental Iron Age architecture in this broader area and begin to tie things together. And ditto with, uh, and ditto with um, another aspect of the Tay Landscape Partnership, we'll be looking at these clay-built earth buildings on the Castle Bowery, really, really rich clays, a kind of adobe-type tradition um, that's quite unusual. Uh, you can see these incredible survivors up here where you have things like built, um, brick walls built on top of clay walls that are, you know, 
Um, and of course, this ties us right back to our Glen Shee buildings. If you remember our tough, our early medieval tough longhouses up in Glen Shee, they're only sort of 40 miles apart. So again, both these projects are kind of linked together. And really what the map down here is reflecting is that if you want to step back altogether from this, what you're really looking at is a kind of research or a local research agenda, which is, if you like, you know, monumental and domestic buildings, 1000 BC to 1000 AD, because what you actually find are that, you know, uh, all these purple things over the top right are all these longhouses, and uh, all the monumental iron age structures are, are, on the left are, are, are divided by the Tay. So we're actually beginning to capture in these different projects um, sort of, you know, actual cultural changes and, uh, and, and differences over time. Um, so really, I've just mapped out some of these. I know that everyone wants to go off to lunch now. Um, there's no right or wrong in any of this. They're just observations in the ways that different projects can be, projects can be developed, top down, bottom up. I'm proposing that there's somewhere in between. And there are lots of good reasons for doing this. It allows you to look down um, in all sorts of ways to uh, perhaps for local funding and, and grasp up for national funding. Uh, and then with partners, you can, you can, you can uh, perhaps have partners on board or national agencies and local community groups. So I'm just suggesting that the regional uh, position is a good place to be. Um, so really just to finish up, I, I, you know, I just you know, to reiterate what we're hearing in terms of threats. Uh, it is a time of change. Uh, there are changes in local government, there are changes happening nationally. And really my clue would be don't lose the in-between part. Yeah, because you know the situation in Wales is very healthy. Uh, in Northern Ireland, so there's a situation where there aren't really any county archaeologists, if you like, and I think uh, that the historic environment there is all the poorer for that. Particularly if you put onto a, a, an area with our geographical diversity and diversity of population <coughs> across that landmass in Scotland. So I think that particularly in Scotland, uh, the regional archaeologists play a critical role. Thanks.